myself when I look back over the last 12 months I couldn't keep it to myself in spite of everything that has happened God was good in January February March and April May June July August September October November and here we stand December 31st 2023 still in the land of the living still have breath in our bodies still have a reasonable portion of health and strength I said I wasn't going to tell nobody but I couldn't keep it to myself it's not any goodness of my own that I'm here today it's because God has been faithful God has been good God has been consistent hallelujah 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 December. When God calls you or chooses you to do something, trust that God has already factored in your age. God has already factored in your background. God has already factored in your strength. God has already factored in your wisdom. God knows you. God knows everything about you and still God believes in you. In spite of my age, my marital status, my never having been with a man, God knew that I could handle being the mother of the Messiah even before Gabriel appeared. I was a teenaged, unmarried young woman chosen by God to be the Christ carrier. And I'm not bragging because it's a privilege. It's an honor, but it's also an awesome responsibility. God knows what you are made of. God knows how much you can handle. God favors you, God chooses you, and that's a reason to rejoice. Another reason to rejoice is because God is God and you are not. In my song, I say, for the mighty one is holy. Another translation says, the God whose very name is holy. And to be holy means to be set apart from all others. We serve a holy God. But more than that, God has been merciful. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that God is wonderful. 
counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. God is sovereign. As John P. Key says, that means my God can do what God wants to do whenever God wants to do it because God is God. God is God and we are not. Not a parent, not a politician, not anybody who is popular. Nobody is above our God. Nobody is even beside our God. Is anybody grateful for who God is? <laughs> If it was a good old-fashioned testimony service, someone might say, God is good, and you'll respond. And all the time, somebody would say, God is a bridge over troubled waters. God is a mother to the motherless and a father to the fatherless. God is a doctor in the sick room and a lawyer in the courtroom. God is the lily of the valley a bright and morning star. God is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. God is patient. God is kind. God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. God never gives up. God never loses faith. God is love. God is the joy and the strength of my life. God is a way maker. God is a miracle worker. God is a promise keeper and a light in the darkness. God is my all and all. You can rejoice this Advent because God favors you. And you can rejoice because God is God and we are not. Another reason to rejoice is because God has done, is doing, and will do great things. Psalm 123, 6 says, The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. And if you want to know some of those things, turn to Psalm 103 where it lists some of the benefits. The psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul and forget not all his benefits. God forgives all your sins. God heals all your diseases. God redeems your life from the pit. God crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. God satisfies you with good things. God renews your youth like the eagles. Indeed, God has done. God is doing. And God will do great things. Therefore, you can rejoice because God has saved you. God has healed you. God loves you, God kept you, God has never left you. But I don't just thank God for what God has done for you. In the Magnificat, Mary, I declared that what God has done for me will never be forgotten. Then I list a litany of things that God promised to do for my people. And if you notice, I use the past tense. Because even though I hadn't seen it yet, I declared it to be so. Because if God said it, I knew I could count on it. Sometimes you have to say what you see until you see what you said. Say what you see until you see what you said. Say what you see until you see what you said. And in Luke 1, I said, God has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. God has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. When I spoke these words, I was concerned about my people. I was waiting with joyful anticipation for God to send a Messiah who would set things in order and realizing that God was doing it. God was doing it through me. I was remembering all the stories the elders shared of how my ancestors heard the prophet speak about how God was going to make things right, even if it meant God would have to turn the whole world upside down. We can rejoice today because we serve a God that promised to make the crooked straight and bring the high places low. We have a reason to rejoice because God favors us, because God is God, because God has done, is doing, and will do great things. And the final reason I wanna share with you is this. You have a reason to rejoice because God remembers God's promises. And I know so much has changed since that first advent 20 centuries ago, but one thing remains consistent. And in spite of what you may have heard or been made to believe, God keeps God's promises. The Bible says the one who promised is faithful. My song is one of hope, faith, trust, longing, and believing that God is not only able, but God is also willing to do everything that God has promised to do. That's why I wrote God has helped Israel and remember to be merciful. For God made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forevermore. So we can rejoice even if God does not respond as quickly as we may like. 
Listen, it was way back in Genesis 3 when God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Then down through the prophets, they spoke of God's promise to redeem, God's promise to save, God's promise to send a Messiah. And it wasn't until centuries later, when Gabriel came to me in Luke 1, he spoke this promise from God. You will have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high God. The Lord God will make him king as his ancestor David was. He will rule the people of Israel forever and his kingdom will never end. In Luke 1 45, Elizabeth said to me, you are blessed because you believe that God would do what God said. And though it took longer than I expected, I really did believe God would do what God said. And it was worth the wait. For according to Galatians 4, it was in the fullness of time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent God's son and a woman gave birth to him so he could set us free from the law and we could become God's children. I'm grateful that God saw fit to use me to play a part in the redemption story. I'm thankful that even after I counted the cost, I still said yes. And I'm grateful that God has kept God's promises to me. I am remembered from from generation to generation. And my son, my savior, the Messiah now sits at the right hand of God. And so as I get ready to go, I encourage you to rejoice because God keeps God's promises. Rejoice because God still uses the most unlikely vessels to bring God's will to pass. Rejoice because God promises that it won't always be like this. Rejoice because the Bible says those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Rejoice because the Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Rejoice because God has promised to turn our mourning into dancing. Rejoice because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Rejoice because the world did not give us this joy and the world can't take it away. Rejoice because after all that you've been through, you still have joy. I have to leave you now, but remember, you have a reason to rejoice because God favors you, because God is God, because God has done, is doing, and will do great things for you, and because God remembers God's promises. November. Always remember that while the world may misunderstand you, God never misunderstands. God always has God's agenda clear. Hear me, it was misunderstanding that put Jesus on the hill called Calvary. It was misunderstanding that made them drive spikes through his hand and, his, and through his feet. It was misunderstanding that made them place a crown of thorns on his head. Misunderstanding that made them thrust a spear through his side. Misunderstanding until the blood began to drip and saturate, saturate the earth. But we know the story. Jesus died until the sun refused to shine and until the earth began to quake and the soldiers cast lots for his garments. So much so until one soldier had to move his impression of Jesus from saying he was the son of God to saying surely he is the son of God. And on that Friday around the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And just a few short hours after that, the Bible says that Jesus hung his head into locks resting upon soldiers, strength by the work of carpentry and breathe his last breath and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The Bible said Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus begged for his body. They took his body down, laid it in a barred tomb, and the old preachers used to close it this way. All night, Friday, he laid. All day, Saturday, he laid in the tomb. All night, Saturday night, he laid in the tomb. But somebody would cry out early Sunday morning. Jesus got up with all power in his hand. And this is where I'm trying to get to. He got up in spite of the misunderstanding. He got up in spite of the confusion. And when he rose, he said, I have all power in the palm of my hand. And I, lay, and I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And the reason that we celebrate today is the God we serve didn't spend after the resurrection trying to get people to understand. The God that we serve 
didn't have folk trying to run around Palestine making all of his enemies suffer. The God that we serve didn't spend time at the resurrection trying to make all of God's enemies fall down at his feet. Instead, God showed God's self to those who had followed him and helped him to understand that I've got to go to the Father, but y'all go to Jerusalem, go to the upper room and pray that the Lord will show you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit showed up, sons and daughters prophesied. When the Holy Spirit showed up, old men dreamed dreams. When the Holy Spirit showed up, the flesh was poured on by the Spirit. It doesn't matter how misunderstood you are. All you gotta do is remember who you are in God. It doesn't matter how misunderstood you are. All you gotta do is trust that God will fight your battles. It doesn't matter how misunderstood you are. All you gotta do is make your enemies your footstools and God will open up doors, shut doors that no man can shut. Bless us in the presence of our enemies. Anoint our heads with oil. Make our cups run over. And it pushes us to testify that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I'm so glad when I say focus on God, I can shout in the midst of a storm. I can celebrate on Friday while I'm headed to Sunday. The hymnologist says, be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you of you October and if you wait around for people to approve you you will lose everything that you have including your sanity and I told you a couple of years ago and the Lord is working on it before we went into COVID I was going through this phase a season I call it where every Sunday I would come here and I would be worried more about who ain't here than who is here. And it would get down in my spirit. And I, I had to be reminded during COVID that you need to stop worrying about who ain't here. 2019, beginning of 2020, I'd be stressed. Come in, sanctuary ain't full. Where folk at to sit in the balcony? Where do these folk at over here? And it stressed me out until. I had to come in here and start preaching to nobody in the sanctuary. And it was a reminder about what your true mission is. And sometimes I believe maybe God is clearing stuff for a purpose. Because here we are 18 and a half years into this thing. The Lord is still sending new people. Still sending fresh wind still doing a new thing and for those of you who've been here over the last couple of months you can feel it when you come into the sanctuary that god is doing something new over the course of my pastorate i've never seen stuff that i'm seeing right now where folk will join and then i'm hanging around talking to people at the church and people still coming up to me telling me they want to join after church is over with I got an email this week from a teenager. Well, I didn't get it, but they sent it to Reverend Butler, a teenager who said, you know what? In the middle of the week, I want to be a part. I want to be baptized in the middle of the week. God is shifting mission. God is shifting purpose. And sometimes it ain't about what you feel, but it's about what God is trying to do. I tell young parents this all the time because I'm getting ready to wrap up and I'm feeling it because I've got two young adult kids and a teenager. Um, my, some of my favorite times of parenting, I don't say my favorite times, some of my favorite times was when my kids were younger. Uh, when they were younger, first of all, they couldn't talk. <laughs> They couldn't ask me for nothing. You know, their little stinky attitudes had to deal with stuff in their pamper or they couldn't find a toy or they wanted a juice box. It's, 
life gets complicated the more older they get. I tell parents now, you better appreciate these small years, these infant years. Don't you be rushing them to get older because with older become more challenges. And I look forward to, I used to come home in Sydney in particular, um, you know, it didn't matter when I came home, what I was doing. She heard me coming to the door. She come flying from wherever she came from, running down the steps. Daddy, never let me leave the house without giving me a kiss and a hug. That's the innocence of childhood. Now, you can love it and appreciate it, but never, ever, ever get it conflicted with the fact that even though it makes you feel good, you still don't have a responsibility to train up. To train up a child. That is not a negotiation or a democracy. And there are going to be times when you don't feel loved or un unwanted. But you have a job to do. Because at the end of the day, you only have a so many years before you send them out in the world. And you won't be walking around being able to fix stuff like you can when they are younger. And I'm telling you that the Lord is putting you in a place that sometimes the decisions you make may not make you feel wanted. Sometimes there are going to be times when people turn their nose up at you. There are going to be times when they say stuff about you. You think you all that. Oh, I remember when you used to do this. But God has called you to a higher standard. God is taking you to another level. God has a huge response, a huge responsibility that is before you. God is trying to do some stuff and sometimes it's not going to feel good. You're not going to feel loved. You're not going to feel wanted. But know that the kingdom appreciates you. The kingdom values you. And it's the last thing that I want to let you know that the text said this. When they came to Jesus and said, you have to go, Jesus went. When you're not wanted in the context of your gift. All right. Now I'm talking about in the context of your gift. Because I don't want some of y'all leave out here, go to work tomorrow. Tell me, my pastor told me to go. <laughs> All right. Then this is recorded. This is online. I say it in the context of your gift. Listen to God tell you what's next. He got up and he left. And I want you to hear me today. When you look at the text, we often set our context by examining the pretext and the post text. We look at what's before and what's after in order to understand what's in it. And so we run into people sometimes who are divorced from where they have been separated and you can understand why they are ambivalent to where they are and have nowhere that they are headed to based upon where they are now because the three usually run in a synergy moment where i'm going where i am where i've been when jesus is rejected in chapter 8 3 8 34 it doesn't tell us how he responds to it but it doesn't have, it doesn't have to because when you look at the next verse, it gives you all the information that you need. 834, they tell him to go. 91, he went. It doesn't tell you how he responded. It doesn't say he opened up his mouth, doesn't say he stretched his hand out, doesn't, doesn't do anything. We don't see his response and how it impacted him mentally, emotionally, physically. 834 says when they saw Jesus, they pleaded with him to get out of town. 91 says Jesus stepped into the boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. He didn't stay around trying to convince people as it related to his gift who had rejected him to accept him. Here's our problem. We are stuck in 834 when it comes to what the Lord is trying to do to us because we're trying to prove that we belong there. You're trying to show folk that you went to elementary school, that you saved, and that the Lord is doing stuff with you. And some of them folk ain't reject, they rejecting you. And so God is saying, listen, you ain't going to stay around for them to accept you. Because the truth is what I'm trying to do going to require for you to be in a new space anyway. So the ministry that I'm giving you might not be 
where you are it may be where you're going and sometimes you got to understand that as it relates to what god is calling you to do if folk pushing you and you pray for god's will and it ain't where you at then you need to move on to where god is trying to take you and sometimes your greatest gift ain't where you comfortable at I had a conversation friday night i was talking about this as it relates to somebody that me and the person i was talking to had in common and the truth is sometimes we try to stay where we feel comfortable when god is saying i got something that may be uncomfortable but i prepared you in the place of your comfort to do the work in the place that you're not comfortable so i'm telling you don't try to listen if the lord if it ain't working stop trying to worry about the folk that you grew up with let it go if you can't save your family members right now circle back but let it go for right now because god got some work for you to do wash your face brush your teeth put your clothes on stop crying about that weeping indoors for a night but what joy comes in the morning and for some of you it is morning and god is saying it's time for you to move on and go do the work that i've called you to do you stagnant because you're trying to stay doing work where i didn't call you and so i pray to god that you hear what i'm trying to say today and that there is a work for you and sometimes you're going to go some places where folk aren't comfortable with your presence. But if the Lord wants you to be there and do the work, then do the work. Let the Lord use you. Don't stay stuck in your places of immaturity. Let God use the gifts that God has put in you. And God is saying, listen, my job is to get you where you need to go. Your job is to do the work. Why don't you lift your hands and tell me tonight? Lord, you're holy. Lord, you're holy. Lord, you're holy. So holy. around and I see all the works your hands have made the awesomeness of you and how your love will never fade me words cannot express what I feel inside I can't describe your glory divine but as a token of
September. We got to be willing to fight and stand in spite of. God has given you and I something, and we got to take possession of it. God has given us everything we need to fight with, but we haven't taken possession of it. Whatever we pray and ask God for, he has already given it to us, but we have got to stand in possession and stand firm, and if we don't, Satan will back us up. Back us up that our back is not only against the wall, but through the wall. We got to be determined and don't back up for Satan. We can't let Satan put us on the run because if we do, we'll be on the run for the rest of our lives. We can't let Satan do that to us. Everybody in here is in warfare. We can't say they're going through this, that, and the other. We all are going through it. Coming through it or been through it or each of us at our own personal wall. Your wall may not be my wall. My wall may not be your wall. But all of us is doing battle with Satan. Each and every day we're doing battle. And it's a daily battle. It's a day in, out and day in. There are times when the attack is so severe and the attack is personal. See, Satan has studied us. He knows our weakness. He knows what ticks you off. With button to push, when we get defend, what we get defensive about, or angry about, and ready to cuss somebody else about, cuss somebody out about, he has studied us. He has studied you, and he has studied me. And sometimes some of us think we are so intellectual and and smart, and that that's when Satan gets in us, gets in our minds, and makes us think that we got all the answers, and we are not wrong about anything. Satan gets in our finances and our families and our marriages and calls us to do everything that we big and bad enough to do. We all got some stuff that Satan gets on us about. Yours might not be open where people can see it, but you might be slipping and sliding, dipping and jiving and peeping and hiding, stabbing people in the back behind the scene. It's personal. It's consistent. In other words, he doesn't let up. It's consistent. When we think that Satan is giving us a break, he comes right back at us again. It's consistent and it's deadly. But the battle, the attack, the war is designed with you and I in mind. The attacks come in different forms. He attacks each of us differently. But he attacks all of us. And we have got to be ready whenever and however he comes. Because we are in a real war. I have never seen or heard of, and you probably haven't either. So much stuff happening before us in this world today. And everybody you talk to wonder what's happening. What's going on in this world? Satan is on the loose. If you didn't recognize it, Satan is on the loose. And Paul says that we have got to keep advancing and keep moving forward. And you know, when I thought about this moving forward, I began to get concerned because with all of this covering the Lord has given us, there is nothing to cover our back parts. And you know, people can come up behind you and we can't see them. They'll sneak up on us. But when I heard verse 18, read verse 18, it lets me know that we have a secret weapon that covers anything that's left uncovered. And that secret weapon is prayer. Paul said we ought to pray in the spirit on all occasions. It's prayer that connects us with our divine source of strength. It's prayer that gives us courage. It's prayer that lets us know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's prayer that keeps us from fainting and keeps us from falling. It's prayer that keeps us from looking over our shoulders. It's prayer that lets us know that it's the key and faith unlocks the door. God has given us the ammunition to fight this war. He said that the battle is not ours, but it belongs to him. We must believe what the word of God says and apply it to every situation in our lives. Jesus said, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. We have got to call the enemy out and make this power worthless in our lives. God has given us the authority to call those things that are not as though they were. When we call out the enemy, we got to do it with power and authority and tell the devil where to go. We got to use the ultimate weapon in fighting this war, and that's in the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. It's prayer that gives us victory this morning. 
Yes, there is a war going on. And we face a powerful enemy. But we don't have to give up. We don't have to be afraid this morning, Six Mount Zion, because the devil is defeated. He shall not prevail. He shall not get the victory because we are shielded on every side. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. God's victory are perfect and complete this morning, and God's victory comes by divine power. Some of you are saying to yourself this morning, well, I heard what you said, but I'm still broke. I have major issues and challenges with my health, and my family is still torn apart. I heard you, but I'm not so sure. I'm not sure that God has set me free. If God has set me free, why am I still in bondage to the devil? If I'm on the winning side, why am I still losing so often? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because if the truth be told, sometimes we are losing the battle because we are trying to fight Satan in our own strength. But you need to remember that it's not your battle. Like a sheep surrounded by wolves, you are safest when you remain close to the good shepherd who is Jesus. It's when you get off on your own that you are at your most vulnerable. The enemy is on the wall path because he knows that his time is short. It's true that he is doing a lot of damage right now, but he is in full retreat. But when God fights the battle for us, we win against the evil one. But the victory that I'm talking about this morning is found in dependency on God. Dependency on God means when we are soldiers in this army, we must uh, uh, put on the whole armor of God. No matter where we are on our Christian journey, it's never too late to put on the whole armor. Dress up. We are in warfare. Dress up. We are in warfare. It's not too late to put on the belt of truth. Buckle it around your waist. It's not too late to put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's not too late to put on the gospel of peace and take up your shield of faith. It's not too late to put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's not too late. And once we put it on and take it up, then we must join the battle. And when we learn how to use the weapon God has given us, we will experience the thrill of victory. And that victory has already been won. When we are secure by what has already been done. See, a long time ago, a war was rage. Jesus waged war with the world and he won. It was war like no other war. No soldiers were dispatched. No ships were sent across the country. No guns were fired. All it took was a divine act of love. This war was not fought on a regular battlefield, but it was fought on an old rugged cross. On that Friday, war broke out. On that Friday, Jesus hung on the cross. It was battle. It was war. It was an intense battle. The victory was secured when Jesus dealt the final blow. What was the final blow? Well, all he did was stretch out his arms and hung his head in his bosom. And when he died, he got the victory over sin, death, and the grave. And because he got the victory, so do we this morning. We got the victory. We got the victory in Jesus. And although we continue to fight, we don't have to wait until the battle is over. Because we know how it's going to turn out. So we can start shouting right now. Even when we are in the thick of the battle. And all our enemies are turning every, way, every which way but loose. But we got to keep on fighting. But don't forget to shout because victory has been won. You can start shouting right now. Confront the devil. Tell him he is a liar. Tell him he we are taking back everything that he has stole from us. Tell the devil today he is under arrest. I got my sword in my hand and enough is enough. I'm coming to get my stuff back. I'm taking back everything that you took from me. Tell him that you're taking it back this morning. Tell them you're taking back your joy. Tell them you're taking back your peace. Tell them you're taking back your health. Tell them you're taking back your anointing. Tell them you're taking back your children. Tell them you're taking back your spouse. Tell them you're taking back your finances. Tell them you're taking back your love. Tell them you're taking back your ministry. Taking it back. Taking back everything you stole from me. In the name of Jesus, I'm taking it back. Tell them greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Tell them that you own the battlefield for the Lord. Promised him that I will serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. Tell them that no weapon formed against you shall prosper this morning. Tell them that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. 
take everything back. Take everything back that the devil stole from you. Strap on the armor with prayer. Be firm. Be strong. Be alert. Be loving. And you will win the battle. Because it have already been won. In Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. August. And so the in-between speaks to your doubt through a means of expectation, trying to get home. Both the sower who scatters and the reaper who gathers, both have to wait. It's not the sowing that messes us up or the reaping that messes us up. It's the waiting. Why? Because we begin, we begin questioning. God, what's up? When are you going to show them results? I'm on a timeline. I'm looking at all these other folk, and I'm sick of it. How long is it going to take you to manifest it? When the time? When the location? When the setting? I'm type A. You don't know who you're dealing with? You shouldn't have put it out there if it won't going to come. I ain't got time to be waiting around. Was the effort enough? Did I give it enough attention? How long will it take for me to see some evidence? What's the next step? God, are you moving? Are you there? Are you here? Are you listening? And all of this becomes too much for us to bear by ourselves. And the only way I can get this without losing my mind or making a stupid decision or giving up too soon or soliciting connections with the wrong kinds of people or considering decisions that are really tragic moments disguised as opportunities is to let the anticipation answer my doubts. Manifestation is not strong enough to go in and have a conversation with your doubts because some of what God is doing is not going to manifest immediately. And I understand and get it, but it's us. It's our culture. Some seeds that are planted, though, will not manifest immediately. So we can't let manifestation talk to our doubts. Our doubts will say, didn't you say God would make a way? Yes. That's what God says. Well, show me. Well, I don't see it. We can't let demonstration talk to our doubts because sometimes what God is doing will not be immediately demonstrated either. But when manifestation can't talk to doubt, when, manifest, when demonstration can't talk to doubt, anticipation can. Because all anticipation needs is faith and trust in God. Because God knows where the seed was planted. My job is to every day show up to the same spot. And even if there is no evidence, I'm going to trust God in the absence of it. Why? Because faith <laughs> is the substance of things hoped for. Now, <clears throat> faith we love, but we hate. It's one of them words, one of them concepts that we struggle with because we love it when it fits our timetable, <laughs> but we hate it when it doesn't. When, I, when I'm patient, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, faith. You better talk about it, Reverend, faith. Y'all better sing, choir, faith. Got my little faith journal and all of this stuff. But after a while, you ain't trying to hear that no more. I don't want, if the preacher say faith one more time, I swear I'll tear that whole church up. If I hear faith one more time, I'm going to go off on somebody. Faith is hard, but it is what it is. It is the substance of things hoped for. It is the substance hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, which means when I can't go to the field and see anything breaking up through the soil, I still offer God my obedience because it is not what is happening above the soil. It is that I know God is doing something beneath the soil. My God, whenever God is going to take us high, it's going to take some time because God got to make sure that the roots go deep and you can't send something high and then let it stand on short roots because the roots will not be long enough to anchor the tree against the storm. 
But if God is doing something great in your life, then don't you get weary and well-doing just because you can't see it. I'm here to tell somebody on this third Sunday in August to tell you that God is doing some stuff beneath the soil. And God is digging your roots deep and finding your firm foundational elements to wrap them around so that by the time God takes you high, you can handle the altitude up there at that type of atmospheric pressure. And God must be getting ready to do something great in our lives because it seems like all God has been doing is digging me deeper and deeper and anchoring me lower and lower. And I know that in order for me to enjoy whatever is around the corner, I have to manage the seasons of in between. So when will I reap from what I've sown? The answer is I'm not sure. But I anticipate that God will keep God's promises to grow you in limited space. I am everything in God that God allows me to anticipate. God will never show me a vision and then not give me a chance to faith up to it. If God shows us something that God is going to do in our lives, the grace of God is that God gives us time to faith up to what the vision is. All right, y'all, give me three more minutes. All right, y'all standing up. You're pushing me to close, but I, I want to say this. <laughs> I want to say this. What God shows will be bigger than what we can imagine. So God gives us time to let our faith catch up to what our reason was trying to discard. Abraham took his son. The son he loved and went to the mountain because God said that I will show you if you offer him as a burnt offering. The Bible says that the next morning, Abraham takes the fire, takes the son, grabs the son, and they make his journey, take some of his servants. Abraham is now on a journey that he has no clue how God is going to work things out. But it's OK because he has planted seeds in the ground. God has already told him that I'm going to make your descendants more numerous than the sand upon the seashore and the stars in the sky. God has already told him what God was going to do. But listen, listen to it again. Take your son, the one that you love, and go to the mountain that I will show you. Now, you're going to make a nation more numerous than the sand upon the seashore and the stars in the sky. The promise that you made me at 100 years of age is that I'm going to be a nation. And then you started that by giving me a son and only son that I love. And then after that, you, you give him to me between 12 and 17 years. You ask me to take him on a journey that will lead to his death. But hear me, y'all. I'm going to do it. And you know why I'm going to do it? Because I have some anticipation. My anticipation is that you didn't show me a vision of being a nation and then going to renege on it. God. Woo! If I sacrifice my son, and here is God's reward to him. When he gets to the place where he is to sacrifice his son and he binds him and places him on the altar and lifts the knife and he's about to jam it into his son, then God stops him. Now, here's the problem with so many of us. We ain't even going up the mountain. Once we start gathering the materials and we start thinking, we like, hey, we ain't going up that mountain. This is the only child I got. We start rationalizing it, start talking about it. Then you get up there, you start wrapping the rope around him, and you're like, nope, it's all good, God. I'll go out like this. But I'm telling you, when you trust God, God will show up. The Bible says, then God stops him and says, Abraham. You couldn't have done this two weeks ago. 14 days ago, your faith won't there. But now I know where your faith is. So go look in the bush. There's a ram caught in the thickets and sacrifice that. And all I'm trying to tell somebody is the reason that God won't let you reap right now from what you sowed yesterday is because God is trying to give us a faith that grows up to be able to wear the vision that God has for us, which means that we have to learn how to celebrate God in the in-between stations. So no matter how hard it is, we've got to be able to shout to that, that all things work together for the good. And God wants to sow in hope along the journey and not just wait on a surprise because God wants the hope of anticipation to help us make sense of everything that is happening before we reap from the harvest. We need to know how all things are working and only anticipation can feed that. And that's why 
I wanted to get to the last thing. Learning to trust the life of spiritual suspense means you've got to give it up to God. And what does that mean? You can't be a person of faith and a control freak at the same time. <laughs> Look at y'all. Heads down. Bro, when you going to finish? That's what somebody going to say. It's past 1145. You can't be a person of faith and a control freak at the same time. Stop trying to shape everything. You sow, you're going to reap. But everything in between ain't in your hands. You can't control what happens after the sowing. Everything in between sowing and reaping is out of the control of the sower. Once the seed is planted, it's out of the sower's hand. Once you turn something over to God in prayer and by faith, it's out of your hand. Stop trying to help God answer your prayer. If you want to handle it, then don't pray. This is why scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And watch this. Lean not. Uh-huh. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Once I surrender it to God, let it go. Let God's hand determine what happens in God's space and in time, God's time. Now, this is the part of faith that is the most difficult for us because we are people, human beings. We get drunk at the panel of control. We want to shake the path and the destination. We want to tell God how to bless us and then tell God how to bless us some more. God says, no, sometimes I leave you in the in-between space because, because only there will you realize that it's out of your hands. But guess what? When it means out of your hands, it's, it, it's in the best place it can be out of your hands. Our hands have limited and been restricted and corrupted enough of our lives that the mere prospect of having it out of our hands ought to be a breath of fresh air. My hope for my seed and my anticipation of my weeping is now a matter of resting in the suspense of what God would do that is in, now God has it in God's hand. This calls for one of the definitions of the word, of the word hope in the Hebrew. And it is the word forbearance. And it's different than patience because I can be patient because I have, I have to be. Forbearance implies that I'm patient while I have some other options. I could decide to use the other options, but I'm going to trust God and not exercise other options because I trust that whatever God's decision God makes for me is better than whatever decision I can make on my own. Just because you have options doesn't mean you got to exercise them. Hello, somebody. Just because you have choices doesn't mean you got to try them all. Hello, somebody. The hardest thing to do is to suppress your emotions so that you can let God work the seed that God has planted. Allow God to grow us in the place of suspense. Refrain from feeling like we've got to move in and out because you can move in that direction. You don't have to make a decision just because you see more than one option. You don't have to respond just because the menu of responses are laid out before you. And you don't have to feel pressed because the options are there. I don't care how you are becoming. I don't care how many people are pressing you. I don't care how many people have had that option resolved in their lives and it's unresolved for yours. I don't care how many times you've been the bridesmaid and never the bride, the groomsman and never the groom. Listen, it don't matter. You have one option, and that is to let hope hold you in the middle ground between the seeing, sowing, and the reaping. And I'm wrapping up that you can anticipate that God has God's um, hands on time and God's on method and God's on design. And if you can trust God and wait on God, I promise you that you will thank God in the end. Because when you look back over your life, you will have to determine that God has been and God is shaping me. July. James says that we're going to come to ask God, we better ask in a hope that trust God's ability to make it happen. And in the original, this means the ask in connection with our faith because our prayer not only comes because we believe in God to answer it, and that's faith, but our prayer comes to God because we want to be complete through the process of hope and what God can do. I offer faith as the container to hold my thinking about these trials because I don't want to mess this up. I want to make the choice that I'm going to respond to this push that I'm going through and hope because I do have other options. I can respond to my situation through pain, preconceived agendas, 
all shape expectations. But when I choose to respond to my struggle with the hope that believes what I'm saying to God is God, I'm, God, I'm going to stay right here and be patient and let you finish the work. I'm heading toward the finish line, but you need to hear it. Somebody has offered to give me a quick relief or a quick escape, but I'm going to wait and be patient and let you finish the work. Somebody has offered to give me a quick relief, relief or a quick escape, but I'm, I'm not going to take the quick way out. I'm going to stay here, anchor in and be like a tree planted by the river of water. And however long I have to work, hurt, has, however long it's going to take for you to work the plan out, I'm going to go ahead and stick it out. I weep for a day, but I'm going to trust that I get through the day because joy comes in the morning. And he says this, if you are going to come to me and ask for wisdom, you will come to me asking in faith and you can't be double minded. God says, don't come praying to me out of one side of your mouth and then leaking doubt out of the other side of your mouth. That is the description of a waverer, and that's the battle. The battle we go through is not that we don't clearly know what God says. The battle we go through is countering what God says with all of those other thoughts. And because we let so many other thoughts sit at the table of deliberation regarding our trials, these other thoughts weigh in and sometimes we will cast our vote for the contrary thought. We have to battle these other thoughts because James tells us how God views us and how God perceives us when we have this dual, dualism coming out of our mouth. He says, you're unstable. We're double-minded. He says, we're tossed and driven. That's a double instability. We're running in every direction depending upon whichever direction the wind blows. This is how God views a person who acts for wisdom in their trials, who then turns around and lets the wind blow, toss and drive them into living in an unstable way. A thought strikes the unstable mind from one direction and they leak it. And then the next day they show up and they're um, living or heading in another direction. Their faith is so shallow in God, they give in to any prevailing and changing thought. You know folk like this. Might be sitting beside them. Maybe you. One day they feel this one way, another day they feel this way. They go to church feeling good. By the evening, they done talk to somebody and they done switched up. And God is saying, don't be, don't be unstable. James is saying, don't be unstable. When you look at this in the original, when he talks about this instability, he's really talking about that, which is flying in opposite directions at the same time. He says, this is what happens to our thoughts. They are moving in different directions at the same time. In fact, that word unstable means to be placed down, but not placed down solidly. It is a synonym of the word wobble. Now, the entertaining thing is a wobbler doesn't wobble merely in one respect. They wobble in everything. So when you run up on a wobbler, don't think that they only wobble in that respect. Wobblers wobble in every direction. James says one of the benefits of faith is that we don't have to be a wobbler. We can be stable. We can be stable, planted by a tree, by the rivers of the water like Mount Zion. I will not be moved. Sometimes I feel wobbly. Sometimes I can find myself about to wobble, but then I got to grab hold of stability. <clears throat> stable in my mind, stable in my action, stable in my integrity, stable in my intention. This is my time to be stable. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't leave me subject to my own gut reactions. Sometimes my gut can lead me down the wrong path. But you've given us stability. And it is in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that when I am trying to go in the wrong direction, the Spirit speaks wisdom to me and reminds me of what things Jesus has already spoken. And so I'm done, but I'm going to end with the ultimate good news. This week, if you're only going to hold it for a week, this week, you don't have to live with worry. Regardless of what's going on in your life, you really don't have to worry about it. And I don't care how bad it is. You don't have to worry about it. Don't waste your time. Don't waste the ability that you have to sleep 
because you are worried about what you have to face tomorrow. And I know some of you are not feeling me because you don't trust James. Well, if you don't trust James, do you trust Jesus? Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, yet our God feeds them. And we are much more valuable to God. Can any one of us, by worrying, add a single hour to our life? <clears throat> Jesus said, why do you worry about clothes? Come on out into the field. Look at the flowers in the field. They never... They neither labor nor spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon and all of his splendor was dressed like one of these lilies of the field. And if that is how God clothes grass in the field, which is here today and possibly gone tomorrow, will God not much more clothe us? Oh, you of little faith, do not worry, saying, what am I going to eat? Or what am I going to wear? Or what am I going to drink? For the pagans run after all these things. God knows exactly what we need. And the scripture closes by saying this. We don't have to worry. Instead, instead of worrying, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And everything else will be added unto you. And I know y'all been super quiet today. Hopefully you taking it all in. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be added. So instead of worrying, worship. Because you can't do both at the same time. Instead of worrying, worship. Because you can't do both at the same time. Instead of worrying, pray. Because you can't do both at the same time. Instead of worrying, pray because you can't do both at the same time. Instead of worrying, if you're going to worry, don't show up. But if you're going to worship, let the worry go and let God have God's way. Don't worry about tomorrow. God's got it. Don't worry about next week. God's got it. Don't worry about next month. God's got it. Don't worry about next year. God's got it. Don't worry about your life. God's got it. When I realize that God's got it, then I can be free. God doesn't sleep nor God slumber. And so I'm going to stop worrying. I'm going to get me some rest. I'm going to stop worrying. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to stop worrying. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to stop worrying. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to let it go because I trust that I serve a God that's got it. Now, how many of y'all in here today actually believe that I know God's got it? I know God's got it. No more worrying. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I ain't going to worry about it because God's got it. I ain't going to worry about it because God's protecting me. I ain't going to worry about it because God's already working it out. Trials, working, practice, patience. I'm working my hope because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. If you can stand on your feet. I want to encourage you to leave the hard work to God. Don't worry about it. You're worrying most of the time ain't going to change nothing. You're worrying most of the time ain't going to do nothing but jack up your health. You're worrying most of the time ain't going to add another minute or hour to your day. You do what you can and let God take care of the rest. June. Thank you for our church and for it being the gateway to having a connection with you. Please keep our church family together and strong. Help us to be a place where people can come to learn about you. Help us to give you the praises that make you happy. Help us to find ways to bring more people to our church and to you. Please open the hearts of others to help them to love more and to be kinder. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice you made when you died on the cross for our sins. Yeah. Thank you for 
continuing to live through us. Lord, we are thankful for our good life and birth in our bodies yeah. and all of God's blessings. God, we are praying for the family members of those who have gone to heaven. We are so glad Jesus was able to heal them in heaven and have, uh, and have them with you. Thank you for all of our good teachers and the chance to get an education. We are thankful for them motivating us to do well and be rewarded mm -hmm. for our hard work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Many of the blessings that are come my way or been byproducts of me to bless the people that I'm in relationship with have come because I talked to somebody, because I heard from somebody. Somebody said something to me that was a blessing and a need all at the same time. And because I opened up my mouth and just simply said, how you doing? Or how your mama and them? Or what's been up with you? A couple minutes later, they deposit something into me that I didn't even know I needed. How many times I've gone to the hospital to make somebody else feel better and I left out and they made me feel better. And so that's why you got to deposit. You got to spend some time and then do it with the right intentions. Do it with the right spirit. When last time you took somebody to lunch or breakfast? Last time you took somebody to dinner? When last time you really intentionally spent time trying to build relationships? Because that's what life is all about. All right, I'm done. This was longer. Pay attention to the guiding lives of others, the spirit moved lives of the anointed of God. Sometimes you got to pay attention to the leadership of others. And I believe that some of us can't be, won't be blessed because you won't follow nobody. Now, I ain't got time to go too deep into that. But for some of us, they, we know everything. You guys only gift. You're the only person that knows everything about everything. And ain't nobody good enough for you to lead. Ain't nobody good enough to lead you. Now, I'm talking to somebody who says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hang, keep hanging around people who are being blessed. Because if I hang around people who are being blessed, they might mess around and lead me to a blessing. I'm going to go and hang around people who are being delivered so that they can lead me to a place called deliverance. You need to find folk because somebody is getting the blessing and somebody is giving it. And you need to hang around to see where the blessing's coming from. And some of you know that the only reason you're blessed is that you knew how to inch up to somebody close. Somebody who was in a position to open a door, make a way, make a phone call, send a text, give a word of encouragement, and it turns your life completely around. So the question is, who are you following? Anybody? Do you have any mentors? I don't care where you are in your life. Everybody needs somebody to sow into them. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how educated you are. Everybody needs somebody to sow into them. And I usually didn't embrace this when I was a little younger, but the older I get now, the more I realize that there are a lot of younger people and my contemporaries who look at me in that role. And I've begun to take that role seriously because the same way they need me is the same way I need others who serve as mentors in my life. And sometimes it's those who can deposit into your life they are the ones who hold you accountable. They're the ones who can speak wisdom into you. They're the ones that keep you from doing dumb stuff. Who in your life challenges you? Anybody? I'm serious. Who, who challenges you? Think about that. Who challenges you? When you're about to do something that's detrimental, you can hear that voice in your head. From that person saying, you know you better than that. You know you smarter than that. I'm talking about everybody around you might listen to you, but you need somebody to listen to. 
Who's calling you to the matter of accountability? And I've got people like that. What about you? If it's nobody, then you need to find somebody because I want to tell you today, you ain't always right. You need somebody that's going to center you, somebody that may inspire you. Every mirror that you walk by, you ain't the only person that, that the mirror is saying is the finest of them all. I guarantee you, all the spirit ain't in you. I guarantee you the spirit is working in some other two people too. And I can guarantee you that you don't have all the answers. I can guarantee you that you are not the center in the center of the road every day. I can guarantee you that you're not thinking straight every day. I guarantee you that you're not on it every day. Yes, even you have some off days. Some days you need somebody to walk up beside you and say, God is working and I need you to follow me. Everybody in the upper room knew the spirit had descended. Luke had descended, had descended. Luke says on them all, because in addition to what they noticed about themselves, they noticed that by listening to others, what was happening to them. If the first message focused on the power of articulation, the second message focuses on the power of observation. God risked us misinterpreting God's presence and God's work by displaying in the lives lived by people around us. And maybe this is why Jesus is trying to warn the disciples that we are to know the presence of real relationships by how a disciple lives with and around other people. All right, finally, here's the last thing. You can change the direction of your life when you let God empower you with God's spirit and God's presence. But you gotta let God in. If you're going to live filled with the spirit, then you got to surrender to being changed by God. Now, the reason I raise this is because scripture teaches us that you can quench the spirit. Mm. You can resist the spirit, which means that the spirit descends wanting to influence your language and your life so you can word a better world. You have the ability to quench the spirit. God, I'm, I'm trying to help somebody. Now, 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 conceptually, that means that I can be in a place praying for a change, and when the Spirit delivers it, I reject it. My point is this. Don't become enamored with the Spirit's presence unless you will live surrendered to the changes that the Spirit brings. And so the first change that God makes in a person's life is the person's life. I'm giving you a car, a house, a job, forgiveness without changing you just makes being just makes you forgiven with a messed up spirit. So here's what God says. When the spirit descends, I am changing you and I will tell you why. Then it won't matter if I change your circumstances. Your circumstances will bend to the power of you being changed. That's a word. And that's how some of us can say today, I can go back to the same no good friends and family. But if I'm changed by the spirit, I will walk in whistling and skipping rather than eyes squinting. I will walk in happy instead of mouth turned up. Why? Because I recognize that my joy is predicated by my surroundings. My surrounding bends to the power of the joy that lives inside of me. And that's how I know. That's how I know that I am maturing 18 years plus into my 19th year of pastoring, even though we haven't celebrated 18 yet. I can tell most of the time, um, that in the preparation of preaching, I don't need y'all to respond to make me know whether or not the preaching is good or not. Now, you had a couple of spots today when you were with me, but a lot of times you've been quiet. I'm looking at some of y'all right now. You've been frowning at me and stirring me down the entire sermon, and I can see your face. And the immaturity in me used to make me feel like I'm not doing a good job. The immaturity in me made me feel like, well, maybe I need to say something to make them feel better. But the truth is, that ain't my job. At the end of the day, I will have to stand for myself. And if God said, did you preach what I told you? Yes. That's all that matters. You got to answer for yourself. You remember fourth Sunday in May 2023, Nelson was preaching himself crazy. 
and you were just looking at them all crazy. I sent the word because I knew what you were dealing with, what you had been dealing with, or what you were going to deal with. And I was trying to defrost your heart so that you could be in a position to handle what you were going through. But you was trying to intimidate him. And that's why the situation broke you down. And I'm telling you today that God is saying that I have better for you. And so your testimony will be, I was negative, but I'm going to be positive. I don't like nobody. But now my testimony is I'm not mad at anybody. My testimony used to be I was complaining, but now I'm praising. I wake up in the morning now saying that this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice. I wake up now saying I'm going to have a good week. I'm going into tomorrow saying the change starts with me. I ain't looking at nobody else. I ain't got nothing to do with what they doing. Whatever I've been before, the change starts with me. And if you can walk in with that type of testimony, I'm believing that the Lord is going to do some major things in your life. But you got to start wording your world and make your world a whole lot better in the future than it's been in the past. April. I want to let you know that resurrection is a happy day. But let me tell you why we celebrate this every year. Because for the past few years, for some of us, it's been mighty dark. But I want to thank God that Jesus shows up today. Not with a word that condemns us. Not with a word that makes us sad. But he comes today with a word and when he opens it up, confetti should fall out to help you recognize that this joy that we have the world can't give it and the world cannot take it away this is what paul meant when he said i wanted to know jesus in the power of the resurrection and i want to know jesus in the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death have you ever considered why he made a separation between i want to know in the power of his resurrection and then say in the fellowship of his suffering because most of us only think about crucifixion and resurrection as being closely akin to the suffering itself but it's trying but he is trying to teach us that when it comes to crucifixion when it comes to the struggle and the suffering when it comes to trouble and drama you don't have to rest in it until it affects you emotionally you can remember that you serve a risen savior and because you serve a risen savior every time he shows up he brings confetti with him which means no matter how bad it has become he has joy in there for you so i'm sorry i try to think of a cool way to close this but it's the 18th time that I'm probably going to do it this way. And I'll say it as long as I'm here, you'll keep on hearing it. Because it's the only thing you say when you gather for resurrection worship. And this ain't the service that you go testing out other stuff. This is the only thing you ought to be talking about on Resurrection Sunday. There's an old hymn that says, I serve a risen Savior that's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always here. And you ought to tell somebody, that's what functions in my life. Because today I'm reminded that he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me a long, like, narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And as we're standing, that's why you can't give up. The resurrection is why you get up every day. Even after hearing of all of the drama in the world that you live in, the ups and the downs, the good and the bad. Every Resurrection Sunday, I take a walk down this hall knowing that no matter what I say, 
I'm going to end up at this part. He died on Friday. He laid in the tomb all night on Friday, all day on Saturday, all night on Saturday. But y'all help me early on Sunday morning. He got up with all power in his hands. And that's why for 365 days, when life knocks me down, I can keep on running. For 365 days, when life turns on me, I can keep on pushing. When the enemy tries to knock me down and defeat me, I can keep on running because I serve a risen Savior. And here's the beauty. We don't serve a dead hero. This ain't no commemoration. This ain't no memorial service. This is literally a celebration. And our praise and our worship is lifted up toward a risen Savior. And so this week, I don't care what comes your way. You ought to walk around saying, whatever comes my way. If God is for me, nothing else is powerful enough to take me out. If he can go down and get up, I can go down and get up. If he can deal, I can deal. If he gives me the power to handle it, I can handle it. And I'm telling you, there's not one thing that we cannot handle with the power of God. March. But when you read the story, a strange thing occurs. When Jacob aged and dimmed of sight, close to death, feeling the mist of the Jordan upon his aged cheeks, he takes his right hand, crosses it over, and instead of anointing the oldest boy, he puts the right hand on the hand, head of the youngest. Then he takes the left hand, crosses it over, and he puts his left hand on the head of the oldest, meaning he gives the firstborn blessing to the young son and the lesser blessing to the older son. This is important. Now, when Joseph's family lies, this is not the first time we've seen something like this with sibling reversal. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, you will discover that in each narrative connected to each generation, the younger son has received a privileged treatment in each generation of the patriarchal narrative dating all the way back to Abraham. Flip through the pages. Isaac gets the blessing over Ishmael. Jacob gets the blessing over Esau. Joseph gets the blessing over all of his older brothers. Now, maybe Joseph knowing the pain of such privilege reversed and the potential dysfunction it can cause for the family, Joseph tries to write what he believes to be a wrong. He walks up to his old daddy who's losing his sight and makes the attempt to correct the hand so that he can place the right hand on the youngest and the left hand on the oldest, but his dad refused to move his hand. He says to Joseph, I, I know, son, I know. I know your oldest son is going to be great, but your youngest son will be greater. And his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. And the scripture says that day that Israel, Jacob, whatever you want to call him, blessed Joseph's two sons in reverse order. Now, if you are the youngest, you don't have a problem with that. If you're the youngest, you get up off of your knees and you go away saying, look at God. I came expecting the second son blessing, but ain't God good? If you're the youngest, you have no problem because if you're the youngest, you get up from your knees and you go out testifying. I don't care what position you're in, what God has for you, it is for you and nothing can take it away. If you are Ephraim, you walk away telling and teaching and declaring to everybody that you are always a candidate for a first position blessing, even if you are standing second in line. And, and just because you show up doesn't second doesn't mean you won't leave first 
that's if you are the youngest. But the problem is, if you are the oldest who is expecting the firstborn blessing, and what do you say to a man who has lived his entire life with the first son expectation, and he just watched his younger brother get what he was expecting? How do you handle life when you've been living with an expectation only to discover that God's will and God's expectation are experiencing a severe polarity? How do you get up off of your knees when you are expecting? Expecting more from God and God has determined that more is not your destiny and I've been living first son position all my life I can hear him saying I've been at the feet of the scholars at the feet of the priests I know the Torah back and forward and what he learns that day is while he may walk around with a certain level of entitlement God reserves the right to bless what God wants to bless when God wants to bless and how God wants to bless. So simply, I wanted to discover how do you get up off your knees and function in power and faithfulness when, in fact, you sat at the table across from you, for, across from you. Y'all went to the same high school, ran track together, played ball together, cheerleaded together, worked in the FBLA, was in the band or the choir in the same section. You did the beta club together. You grew up in the north side of Church Hill together. You had parallel backgrounds. You grew up in the same neighborhood. And why did God decide to drop prosperity on them and struggle on you? It's when you were in the same cubicle or the same office next to somebody. Y'all went to training together, had the same merit manager together. Both of y'all had subsequent parallel raises every single year. You have come up from the bottom to middle management. And when both of y'all apply for the same job, you go in, do just as good, have the same dream. Your performance evaluations are the same, but they get the job and you don't. You and the girls been chilling, same happy hour, but Mr. Wright comes by and scoops them up. Same coach, same scheme, but you got the shot for the next level. How is everybody in your family grown, healthy, and strong, but you are the one that carries the dysfunctions and the sickness? And I need to know because it is easy to celebrate when you are the blessed and the hooked up one. But how do I live when the perception of the blessing has missed me? And I want to put this caveat on this because all too often religion has made the articulation of the faith so cheap and so diluted that it brings to us short-sighted answers that are not enormous enough to handle the complexity of these questions. See, I don't like a gospel that always ends up in a smooth resolution because sometimes, y'all, you are stuck in a season where your lives are not black or white. It's gray. And God ain't changing it. And I need you to know, can God sustain me in the gray areas of my life, you ask, when I can't get the raise, when my son is not spared, when my daughter becomes pregnant, when my relationship is hit a wall, when the drama is high and the dealings are low, when the drugs are calling and I'm listening. I need to know that God has a word for me in those spaces, too. And don't y'all ever believe that God has written scripture just for us to come to church and have these simple how to's. That's what angers us sometimes about the 21st century, because we come up to this simplistic stuff that attempts to make people believe that all prodigals come back home. They don't. And that everything works out for those who believe sometimes it doesn't. Because the truth of the matter is, some of us are going to be just like what is spoken in the book of Hebrews. We're going to die still believing and still stuff may not have worked itself out. And here is the question. Can God get praise from me if you are not being blessed in the moment, even though you and everybody else believe that you should? Expectations of what this should be. Whatever God has for me is for me and I need to be thankful and here's the truth everybody can't be number one everybody can't be the firstborn everybody ain't gonna be the top dog everybody in here isn't destined for the top all of us in here aren't going to be the greatest or the king of the hill everybody can't be the president the ceo hnic whatever you want to call it everybody's not going to be the biggest the brightest the boldest everybody in here is not destined to be a celebrity or a tv superstar or a mogul or an icon or america's next great thing that's not everybody's lot 
It's not everybody's destiny to be rich, to experience the mecca of financial prosperity. Everybody's employment elevator is not going to the top floor. You won't have the card with the secret code to it. Everybody in here will not wear designer label stuff every day and drive around in something that literally drives itself. It's not everybody's destiny. And I want to tell you why. Because life doesn't happen that way. And it's hard, I understand. So the question is, how do I get up and live powerful when that's not me chasing a dream that has been sold to me and I never cash it? How do I survive when the gospel is not prosperous? And the text teaches us this. I get up and I live powerful when I receive the blessing and when I recognize and I become firmly convicted that blessings can be, listen, appreciated, valued, and wanted from anywhere at any time. And I don't have to be number one to be blessed and thankful. And so hear me today. You don't, you don't. You need to preach this to yourself. I need to thank God for the storms that bring growth. I need to thank God for the downs and the ups. I need to thank God for the good and the bad. I need to thank God for the sun, the shine, and the rain. I need to thank God when stuff goes my way. And I need to thank God when it doesn't seem like it's going my way. God demonstrates this as we try to circulate ourselves around the mystery of who God is. And the one thing that God demonstrates in this text is that God's ways are not ours. God's thoughts are not ours. And the beauty of it all is that there is no formula, no method, no scientific approach, no calculated grid upon which you base your understanding of God. It doesn't matter how many times you lay your dreams and expectations on the side of God's extended right hand. It doesn't mean that God will not reserve the right to switch them if God so chooses based upon God's sovereignty. And while I'm here, I may as well suggest this. That's what we want. Many of us want to be in relationship with God, with the God that we can manipulate because we're so, because uh, we're too fickle to trust that we will all, that God will always make the right decision. One thing I've learned over the course of the years is that it doesn't matter, y'all, how much you scream. Because you can scream and God still can go the opposite way of what you want. Doesn't make a difference how much you holler, chant, run, give, how much you do. God will do what God wants you to do. So don't you ever let anybody make you feel like if you don't scream enough, run enough, holler enough, you ain't holy enough for God to bless you. What God does, what God does it is what God wants to do when God wants to do it. God ain't no puppet. Don't make a difference how much you do sometimes. God's going to do what God wants to do when God does it because it's all about God's will. February. Thank you, Lord. Refreshing. His plan, say it. The time of your great blessing. Expect nothing but victory. That's the promise of our King. To do exceedingly, y'all. Above what you ask for me. I wish y'all could put your hands on it and say it. Anybody expecting great things, say it. Come on, everybody, listen up, sing. 
January. You can see this, for example, in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. There was a man who threw a great dinner party and he invited many people over. And when it was time for the dinner, he sent the servants out to the invited guests saying, come on, y'all, the food is on the table. They all began to beg off one after the other, making excuses. The first said, I bought a property and I need to go look at it real quick. Send my regrets. Another said, I bought five teams of oxen. I really need to go check on my oxen. Send my regrets. Yet another said, I just got married and I need to get home to my wife. Send my regrets. The servant went back and told his master what had happened. The master was outraged. He told the servant to quickly go out into the city streets and, and alleys, collect all who seem like they need a meal, the homeless, the misfits, the wretches, anybody that you can lay your hands on and bring them here. Now, when you investigate texts like that, there is rejection of promise. But in this text, there is no rejection of the man. Jesus provides However, a framework for the man to make a decision as to whether he wants to exercise his commitment level. And it's because Jesus knows that the man has integrity with his promise. He just hasn't done any exercising of his commitment. So instead of turning him away and allowing another to come, he says, in effect, to this man, I'm going to give you credit for your promises but let's work on your commitment. So I hear you, huh? You say you want to go wherever I go. That's because you think I'm going to stay at the Jefferson or the Ritz Carlton. And we're going to have a chauffeur transportation from the airport to when I speak. You think we're going to be chilling in the classiest places. You think that after I'm finished speaking, we're going to the best restaurants in town. We're going to eat a nice steak. We're going to eat a filet mignon or a strip or get a baked potato, broccoli on the side, a drink of your choosing. We're going to go back to the hotel, sleep on cushioned pillows until tomorrow when they wake us up. Our clothes would already be cleaned. Our shoes have been shined. We're going to get back on an airplane and on our way to the next stop. But let me check your commitment because my next engagement I'm walking to. And when I get there, they're going to try to put me out and stone me. The places I'm going, they're going to be calling me a devil and say that I am a misrepresentation of the kingdom. Some places that I'm about to go to, when I get there, I'm going to be met by fierce opposition. Those from the church who are mad that they're saying that I'm bringing the wrong gospel to the street. You talking about you want to follow me wherever I go? If you want to go wherever I go, let's check the commitment. Foxes have more dependency on the creation of a hole, and birds can predict that they can find the resources to build a nest. But if you're going to hang with me where I'm going, certain things we don't know but we don't have to because you're not walking with me by sight. You're walking with me by faith. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but if you are following Jesus, you're going to have to let Jesus lead you. And some of the places that you go to ain't going to make sense. And it won't make sense until God decides that it's going to make sense for you, which means that you may be dropped in a pit you may be sold in a caravan. You may end up in a palace and then be sent to prison. And 20 years later, it will finally click that the reason that God dropped me in a pit wearing a coat of many colors come to Bible study is because God was trying to put me in a place where I could be the redemption and salvation for my entire clan. God wants to know, can you roll with me even if you don't know what's next? Can you hang with me even though you can't control it? Can you roll with me even if I go left when you want to go right? Can you roll with me if there's not a hefty salary involved? Can you roll with me if they don't give you a mic and put you up in front of people? Can you roll with me even if nobody ever gives you a certificate of participation? Can you hang with me when nobody will may not ever call your name? Can, can you hang with me if they persecute your name? And God says, I want to suggest to you um, that I need you, but I need you to do it my way. 
And it's why Paul says, I learned that when I'm weak, I'm strong because God's grace is sufficient and God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. I'm wrapping it up. I want you to take the challenge today to stay committed no matter what. And don't let frustration and fatigue make you tap out. And most importantly today, I want you to walk away with the challenge that I, I believe God doesn't want us to be half committed. God don't want us to be halfway in and halfway out. I saw this story of a college dude that walked into a photographer's studio. He had a picture of his girlfriend. It was framed. And he walked in and he wanted the picture duplicated. Now, in order to duplicate it, it had to be removed from the frame. And in so doing, and in doing so, the studio, the studio owner noticed an inscription on the back of the photo. It was all sappy and special. My dearest Tom, I love you with all my heart. I love you more and more each day. I will love you forever and ever. I am yours for all eternity. And then it was signed Helen. But it did contain a PS. And the PS says, if we ever break up, I want my picture back. <laughs> That's not the kind of commitment that I think God is talking about. I'm not talking about that halfway in and halfway out stuff. God, if you do this and, and do that, then I got you. But if you don't, I ain't going to church no more. I, wanna, I, I want you to love me and never turn back. I want you to treat your relationship with God, y'all, as a sacred trust. I know it's still around the first of the year. And although we've lost some folk already, there are still a few who are saying, God, I will go wherever you want me to go. That's why some of y'all are right here today, because it's January. And you are starting this year fresh. God, I ain't going to miss church at all this year. God, I'm going to be on work, gonna be on time for work this year. God, I'm going to exercise and I'm going to eat right this year. I'm going to treat people kind and I'm going to do right this year. God, I'm going to mess around and do something I ain't never did before. I'm going to forgive folk this year. And all that's fine until the mood passes. Somebody says, I got God with me all the time as soon as something happens that you don't want to happen. I don't need no church. I got a church all by myself. And God says, no, let's check the commitment. I'm going to put some stress on you and see where you are and see if you can hang with me when your body is tired and when your mind is confused and the people that you live with and hang with get on your last nerve. Will you be able to get up next Sunday, put your clothes on and say, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it because if you're going to follow me wherever I go. That's what God is saying. You're going to have to follow me while we make sense of some of the foolishness of life. The ups and downs, the good and bad, the friends and the foes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against power and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. So why are you saying all that, Pastor? Because I'm trying to tell you that God is saying, don't get weary in well-doing because we're going to reap if we faint not. So God says, keep on praising, keep on pressing, keep on preaching, keep on worshiping, keep on shouting, keep on serving, keep on reading scripture, keep on testifying, keep on witnessing. And though the night may be long and the valley be dark, don't you ever forget that we are descendants of the psalmist who says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That you, God, will provide a table in the presence of my enemies. And while I'm seated at the table, surrounded by my enemies, you are good, so good, that you anoint my head with oil. Hands are bowed, eyes are closed. That God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this worship experience. We thank you, God, for the previous 300 and 
64 days. We thank you, God, for the beautiful things that you have done. Many of them we didn't even deserve. Some of them we didn't even expect. Some of them came our way, didn't even know why, but you blessed us anyhow. Thank you, God, for progress. Thank you, God, for growth. Thank you, God, for maturity. Thank you, God, for wisdom and for knowledge. God, some things came our way this year unexpected that we didn't expect. We were dealt some cards that we didn't want to see. We were shown some things that we didn't want to see or hear. But even still, you've been faithful. We still hear God with our head up, with, with our shoulders broad, with our chest out. We're still believing that you are a miracle worker. Still believing that you can open up doors. Still believing that you can heal, that you can change. Still believing that God, you can do the impossible. And we're walking believing it God the truth is whatever tomorrow holds we don't know but we know that we got right now and because of right now I can say thank you and God I love you I appreciate you I appreciate you for carrying me I appreciate you for holding my hand I appreciate you for lifting me up. I appreciate you for blocking the arrows that came my way. I appreciate you, God, for keeping me strong. I thank you, God, right now for covering me. I thank you for a hedge of protection around me. And I thank you, God, for what is to come. Believing, God, that you are God that can do anything, that will do anything, that has done everything and i believe in god i'm gonna walk into that in the new year so i'm claiming i'm claiming that 24 is gonna be a good year i may not know everything that stands in front of me i may want to be able to control some of it but the truth is god i don't know but i'm walking in hand in hand with you I'm dropping the hand of worry and I'm grabbing the hand of God. And God, I'm making this journey with you. We're going to do it together. And I'm trusting and believing that all things are going to work together for your good. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. Bless y'all. Go out and have a good rest of the day. Happy New Year to you. Have a prosperous 2024, healthy 2024. Come on, Zion, you ought to be giving him the praise right now as you think about all that God has done for you. Come on and put your hands together. We've come to give him the glory that he deserves. How many of you know that we serve a good and faithful God? Come on, won't you help us sing? As I look back over my life I can see how your love has guided me Even though I'm done wrong You never left me alone But you forgave me And you kept on blessing This I call to my mind Therefore I am home Is it because of your mercy? Because the
the shackles and you set me free Honey, you made a way, I know it Turn my darkness into day Bring my joy in the time of summer Oh, for my tomorrow Peace in the time of summer Strength with a 